Hello, my name is Geneviève Perrault. As the chairholder of the UNESCO Chair in Applied Research for Education and Prison, and on behalf of the team, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this new series of five webinars on research and innovative practices in prison education. Indeed, the success of last year allowed us to understand how widespread the various issues surrounding education and prison can be, and how great the needs for education and prison are. We had the chance to discover very inter interesting international initiatives and a very dynamic community of researchers and practitioners involved in prison education. Before we move on, I would like to highlight the renewed collaboration of the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning and the Cooperation Institute for Adult Education, ICEA, in these events. We warmly thank them for supporting the UNESCO Chair in Applied Research for Education and Prison, as well for their commitment to adult education. To start this new series, we are presenting two projects that have literally opened the prison's classroom. Indeed, the Canadian Walls to Bridges and the UK Learning Together programs both bring campus enrolled and incarcerated students together to study semester-long courses in prison settings. Based upon similar foundations on, of transformative education and destigmatizing de others, both programs involve university prison partnerships. In today's presentation, Mr. Alex C. Truong, Assistant Professor of Criminology at the University of Ottawa, will be moderator. And Professor Anne Grady will present in a few minutes uh, today's panelists. It is a great pleasure to welcome them all. Thank you for your participation. Finally, here are some basic guidelines for all our participants. The original event is in English, and you will listen to the French or Spanish version by selecting your preferred language at the bottom of their screen. You can ask your question using the Q&A function at, of the Zoom platform throughout the presentations. Our guest will answer questions at the end of all communications. The film event and also the, the presentation to this presentation will be posted on the chair's website within two weeks. We hope you have a nice webinar and thank you for being here. Mrs. O'Grady. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Um, we are absolutely delighted to be presenting this, um, this afternoon, this excellent uh, UNESCO presentation. Um, I'm going to just let you know who's going to be talking to you this afternoon. Um, it's been a real collaboration across borders. So it's a prison university partnership, but it's also a partnership across borders. Uh, and we're really excited to be presenting this um, seminar in a podcast format, which we think is quite unique. So um, hopefully it will go according to plan. From our Canadian team, our Canadian colleagues include uh, Sandy Lihal, Shoshana Pollock, Tori Poe, Ashleen Gallivan, Jennifer Kilty, and Alexis Trong. And from the English team, we have Paul Hamilton, Kirsty Teague, and myself, Anne O'Grady. So we'll be trying to take it in turns to share with you some of the key points and features of our partnerships um, for you to explore, understand, and question. So the seminar um, aims to share with you the work of our two programmes. Uh, as Genevieve said, we work collaboratively with students from prisons and for, um, from higher education institutions. In Canada, the programme is called Walls to Bridges, and in England, the programme to date has been called Learning Together. So adopting this podcast presentation style, we'll share with you, the audience, some of the important aspects of the programme, from pedagogic principles to logistic challenges. We won't be able to cover everything, but we hope by the end of the seminar, you'll be inspired to consider how you might think about engaging in such learning programmes. And of course, we'll be happy to receive any questions either during or after the event. The webinar is going to be facilitated in this form of question and answers that uh, enables us to share the similarities and differences of our programmes. And uh, the one of the Canadian team, Alexis, has uh, volunteered himself or been volunteered um, to take on the role of um, or orchestrating the questions. So over to you, Alexis. Thank you, Anne. Before I start my first question, um, I'm, I would like to let the audience know that we will be switching between presenters a lot. Uh, so it might be strategic to put your application in gallery view 
uh, on PC for me, it's kind of up in the right corner uh, so that you can see everyone at the same time for the whole presentation. So my first question goes out to Shoshana and Paul. And uh, I would like you to, uh, um, to tell us a bit about your program. So what are they, uh, what are they not? And what are the values and philosophy between, uh, between both? Thank you, Alexis. I'll start with um, Walls de Bridges, and I'm just gonna say a few words about our values and philosophy. Uh, the, some of the other details I think will come out as we move through the, the questions you're gonna ask us. Um, but just briefly, Walls to Bridges in Canada brings together students from post-secondary education institutions to study with incarcerated students. Our program mission is to create educational opportunities in correctional settings where the experiences of teaching and unlearning challenge assumptions, stigmatization, and inequality. To go along with that mission, we have a set of principles. A couple of them are, are a couple of key ones are um, a central value that we hold is that people with lived experiences of criminalization and incarceration should be given leadership opportunities both within the classroom and within the larger context of the Walls to Bridges program. So for example, we hire students who are in prison to act as teaching assistants for our classes. Incarcerated and formerly incarcerated alumni train professors in our teaching model. And Walls to Bridges alumni who have been released from prison provide public education workshops to community organizations and university audiences. We also believe that learning is relational. In the Walls to Bridges classroom, learning comes from the connection with others, understanding how our experiences and our backgrounds influence how we relate to the course material. In sum, then, our teaching methods are built upon the relational nature of learning and the principle that criminalized people should be given leadership opportunities in our program. And I'll turn it over to Paul to talk about the Learning Together program. Thank you very much, Shoshana. We'll also be talking about our values throughout the presentation, but just in terms of what Learning Together is, briefly, it's a program that enables people serving prison sentences, and higher education students to study alongside each other. Um, over the past five years, there's been a real growth in the development of such prison university partnerships uh, across England and Wales. We here at Nottingham Trent University, NTU, we piloted our first Learning Together programme back in 2017, whereby we brought together 12 NTU students from criminology and education undergraduate programmes with 10 learners from our prison partner to explore the concepts of criminal and social justice. Whilst the academic content of the programme was set at level five, second year undergraduates, it didn't attract university credits for participants. So rather it was provided as a, an extracurricular opportunity for all of the students taking part. So students received lectures from colleagues across academia and practice, and were invited through democratic participatory dialogue where knowledge is, is valued and valuable to critically consider and reflect on the topic of the lecture, sharing ideas, views and perspectives. The end of the programme culminated in, in what we had, we had a graduation event witnessed by an audience made up of internal and external stakeholders, which included dignitaries, family, friends, media outlets. And the graduating students had the opportunity not only to present the key aspects of their learning, but also their personal reflections of this innovative and unique project. All students received a certificate to confirm their participation in the programme. Over to you, Alexi. So building on that, can you tell us a bit more about why you started the programme and what are the more specific goals of each programme? Again, Shoshana and uh, Anne, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so we started the program 10 years ago. We're just celebrating our 10th anniversary uh, right now this year um, in order in, in sort of in recognition that criminalized people and imprisoned people experience significant barriers to education. And so on that level, it was, it was a, a, a easy uh, goal was to try to provide access to education while incarcerated. The second piece was that we wanted to bring outside students in 
um, to engage with incarcerated students in order to build a kind of collaborative learning community that was based on critical analysis and reflective practice. And part of that is to um, involves an aim to dispel stereotypes and challenge assumptions. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, to develop a learning community that helps um, share power and decentralize professional expertise, such as those um, coming from those of us in the academy. I'll turn it over to Anne. So when we first started our program, we didn't really have any goals. We didn't really know what we, do, we were doing. We just knew that we wanted to bring these groups together. Um, the academic team had a real background of working in the prisoner communities. We had lots of ways that we'd done that and we'd established a knowledge and understanding of prison and prisoner life and the importance of challenging uh, societal stereotypes in relation to that cohort of our community. So I suppose that was the key underlying ambition of the programme is to challenge the, 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 the common stereotype. So we wanted two groups of people who might not generally meet in society to share some time together studying. We wanted to contest that individuals would be able with support to engage in dialogue, reflect on their presumptions of each other and to explore the basis upon which their views have been constructed. So we were in a really lucky position. We had some really good relationships with quite a few prison partners and they were also quite keen to support us to provide such opportunities for their prisoners. So individually, there was potential for reflection for all participants, both academics and students. And as a result, to co-construct a new revised understanding of oneself and one's position in society, as well as within each other's groups. So from a partnership perspective, we brought two significant and very powerful institutions together to provide the opportunity to work collaboratively with colleagues to undertake projects that were progressive in supporting better understanding of how we collaborate jointly and so we can enhance the community understanding, particularly of prisoners. So from a community perspective then, there was a mutual shared understanding and interest, both in the development of a shared learning community for knowledge development and exchange, but also in developing community links and relationships and recognising the transformational potential and of, of this work and potential contribution to both social and economic outcomes. My third question will go out to Jen and Kirsty. Um, I would like to know, how do you recruit your students for both programs? And have you figured out or defined specific inclusion or exclusion criteria? Okay, uh, for Wall Street Bridges, generally speaking, there's a two phase application process. So uh, the first phase requires that both the inside students, the incarcerated students and the outside university enrolled students provide written responses to a series of questions about why they're interested in taking a Wall Street Bridges course, what they hope to get out of the experience. Uh, and in the University of Ottawa program where Sandy, Alexi and I teach, um, course instructors then consult with our Wall Street Bridges collective that's based here in Ottawa. And we ask our collective members to help us to make a short list of the outside student applicants. So we anonymize all of the data uh, and then we get together for a few hours and we talk through who should be invited to the phase two which is an interview process. And so the interview process really helps to identify those students that are committed to equity, that are committed to the general principles and philosophy of Walls to Bridges. And it also helps us to try to weed out students that might be interested in, in taking this course out of morbid curiosity about the carceral context or um, anyone that might hold a problematic or stigma, stigmatizing or punitive view of incarcerated people. So the recruitment process for inside students requires the course instructor, at least the way that we do it in Ottawa, uh, requires that the course instructors go into the institution itself, both to advertise the class, to hand out hard copies of the written application uh, questions. And the participation of each potential inside student also has to be approved by the institution, which typically uh, is going to assess the applicant's institutional behavior. They're gonna cross check any possible non-association clauses that, that might exist between different prisoners. 
And while there are no exclusion criteria technically for inside students, for example, um, you know, the crime that they are accused of or have been committed uh, or convicted for, um, ironically, outside students that have criminal records are excluded by the institutions who won't allow them back inside. So there seems to be, um, you know, a bit of a difference there in, in terms of the inclusion criteria. Thanks, Jen. So Anne and Paul have mentioned this already, but our Learning Together cohorts here at uh, Nottingham Trent University comprise specifically of BA education and BA criminology second year undergraduate students who then learn alongside our prison based learners. So for each of the programmes that we run, we have to work with our prison partner to negotiate an appropriate cohort size. And then from them, when we know how many students we can have, we run a series of engagement sessions with those who are interested. So if our university based students are interested in the programme, then they're asked to complete a written application form and they have to respond to two questions. So the first being, why do you want to participate in this programme? And the second being, what do you feel you can contribute? We then sit alongside our prison partner for that particular programme and we interview the shortlisted candidates. Um, and then following that, we offer opportunities to visit the relevant prison before commencing the vetting process. Um, our prison partners, they tend to lead on the recruitment for prison based learners and they are in charge of the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the most part. So the inclusion criteria can sometimes include the need for prison based learners to be enrolled onto a degree programme, typically sometimes with the Open University. And sometimes the exclusion criteria might be if an individual has a history of adjudications. Um, often it's very staff members inside the um, institution who will decide on their own inclusion and exclusion criteria. So that might be the prison um, education manager or the head of learning and skills. Um, and then usually um, as a staff members will be invited along to be part of the interview process of our prison based learners so that they get a sense um, of exactly what learning together is about and an opportunity to ask us questions. And it's also an opportunity for us as um, higher education instructors to assess suitability of candidates. Excellent. So we know a bit more about the programs and how we recruit the students. Um, Sandy and Anne, uh, for the, the fourth question, could you describe your pedagogical approaches and maybe give us some examples of how you design your courses and why? So uh, Words to Bridges is inspired by indigenous circle pedagogy. So where the circle is used as a space where you learn with yourself. So that means that we embrace the fact that all the participants bring to class every week who they are physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. So when it's relevant to the topic, uh, the participants share in class or in their journal uh, pieces of their lives, their past, their presence, their sets of beliefs. Um, however, and that's important, the goal of the program isn't to fix or to save each other, not even to give advice to one another, but to learn together. And uh, as a university professor, I have to say that this course gave me the opportunity to be a student again and to learn so much from all the different individuals in the class. Uh, the essence of the pedagogy is learning from sharing, learning to listen, and listening to learn. So that means no teacher, no outside student, no inside student, but just a community uh, where each individual contributes to a collective objective uh, by means of experiential activities. So in each World of Bridges courses, we develop collectively the group guidelines and we all take responsibility for them. Uh, we also organize group projects uh, and the process itself often becomes the main content of the course. As a facilitator, uh, I make each week a lesson plan, but it is just a plan. It is impossible to know how the activity will turn out uh, as a participant, as the one building the content of the course. I'm just there to help, help try to help build a safe, safe space and uh, to offer the pedag pedagogical tools to create knowledge on specific topics. That's how it works for us. So um, bu building on what Sandra's just said, you know, our, our project in, in England was very similar. You know, we took the framework of uh, 
of Ferrer based on you know democratic partic participatory dialogue. But two of the really really important words that came out of the of the dialogic approach was was one um, that was coined by our, our students of being re of real talk, being able to really engage in conversation and dialogue. And in fact, extending this idea of, of a safe space to one of being a brave space. So this idea that actually you could be brave, you could you could have conversations. So, you know, building on that, that philosophical approach of Ferrer, where education is considered the space in which social change can be activated, like our colleagues in Walls to Bridges, our ambition was not to change people, but to enable people to reflect on their own being and to be able to activate their own change and their own history and their orchestrate their own space, really. So the learning space was a space that was constructed in such a way that all contributions to any discussion were valued and valuable. This idea of democratic knowledge, active citizenship, where everybody has a, a role to play in society and that society that, and that role is recognised. So the model of learning support and um, support the model of learning that we um, invested in was to support students capacities for critical engagement with and development of their own self-knowledge so therefore in practice our, our sessions were really learner centered they were very interactive and they were very reflexive participants were really encouraged to be critical thinkers weighing up and evaluating really complex and often competing ideas and we drew on a range of different communication strategies where learners then were able to develop their ability to respond to and share ideas. And, you know, our students told us, you know, through empowerment, they develop confidence and through the educational experience that afforded to them, they um, identify personal growth and self-awareness and empathy. So really powerful stuff. For our fifth question, um, which would be from the point of view of inside and outside students, what is the impact of taking such a class. Uh, for Walls to Bridges, we'll have Ashton and Tori, and for Learning Together, we have Paul. Uh, so from my experience as an outside student, um, I think just the, the environment that Sandy described, that kind of radical space where I was invited to really listen, learn, and reflect, I think that really helped me break down stigmatizing assumptions that I had about prisoners and you know assumptions that I didn't even realize I had at the time. And, you know, particularly as someone who grew up with a parent who was frequently incarcerated, I carried a lot of internalized shame, blame and judgment towards criminalized people. So upon entering the Walter Bridges classroom, I was so quickly forced to confront the common humanity that inside and outside students share and really recognize that there are more similarities, similarities than differences that characterize our experiences. Um, so in this way, I was also forced to confront how deeply I had internalized that sort of us versus them mentality, which had actually sustained over a decade of estrangement between my father and I at the time. And upon engaging in dialogue about these experiences with fellow inside students and learning more about inside students' experiences, I ultimately left the Wall Street Bridges program with a much deeper sense of compassion towards those who experience criminalization and released a lot of the blame I'd carried towards my father while ultimately coming to a place of forgiveness and understanding. But I also left the program with a renewed sense of commitment towards increasing access to community-based alternatives to criminalization and imprisonment. After seeing firsthand how dehumanizing and isolating the prison environment can be, it really became clear to me how important it is to make sure that meaningful community supports are put in place to prevent criminalization in the first place and to make sure that families can be kept together to mitigate many of the harms and barriers that stem from imprisonment, release and reentry, and which ultimately lead to cycles of criminalization. Yeah, as an outside student alumni and GVI collective member um, for 10 years, Walls to Bridges have changed the direction of my professional path and how I have showed up in my personal life. The Walls to Bridges course opened my eyes and ears to the erasure of incarceration from community awareness and to the dehumanizing institution of prison. After several years as a collective member, I left a college position to assist as part-time staff with Walls to Bridges. Paradoxically, within the confines of a prison space, the Walls to Bridges community expanded my embodied sense of knowledge, listening to and listening from what others have to say. 
from diverse lived experiences and perspectives. As an educator and a facilitator, learning in circle as part of the Walls to Bridges community further deepened my ways of acquiring knowledge through my whole self, as mentioned before, the physical, emotionally, mental, and spiritual integration. When a community is willing to facilitate and celebrate through collaborative achievements and the uncomfortable tensions, learning extends beyond individuals to collective sharing and well being. Being part of this community has prompted my silenced voice to speak up in different areas of my life and has taught me what holding space and consensual leadership feels like. Walls to Bridges pedagogy and being part of a circle creates spaces to unmask, to break down colonial canons, and to collaborate in really creative, innovative ways of knowing. Thanks very much for that. I think um, what our Canadian colleagues have just talked about really resonates with some of our experiences, actually. And I think for our inside prison-based students, taking a, a learning together class was, was often considered to be a really significant opportunity for them. I think it'd be true to say that some of our students stated they were enrolled on the class without any real understanding of what they were signed up for, whereas others stated they had to work really hard to get onto the programme. And, and I'm reflecting with students about the impact of participating in the programme they did state feelings of initially feeling very sceptical about what the programme's all about, feeling nervous and anxious, but that typically by the end of the programme, they said the programme had allowed them to feel quote unquote normal, that they'd been able to lose that identity of being a prisoner just even just for a while. And were able, as Zan talked about a moment ago, to participate in, in real talk by engaging in meaningful conversations with others. And I guess for our outside uh, university-based students, I think uh, the main thing to stress is that getting, and Kirsty talked about, is getting onto uh, a learning together programme uh, was a competitive task, you know, required high levels of commitment and extremely high expectations. So students had to submit a uh, written application being before selected for interview. Interviews were conducted with, with both university and prison-based colleagues. And, and if accepted onto the programme, then they obviously have to go undergo prison security clearance measures. For, for the outside students, uh, I think it'd be true again to say that they shared these feelings of nervousness and anxiety, but also actually a commitment and a pride about undertaking a learning together programme uh, often associated with many of the students not previously experienced a prison environment, as you'd expect. And on, on reflecting on the programme, they shared how quickly entering a prison became normalised and how surprised they were at how quickly they, they almost forgot that the learning space they were doing learning together in was in a prison. But um, they're, they're obviously, there are you know, some downsides potentially in terms of they, they shared those frustrations about how the prison structures can compromise the programme, maybe because uh, prison was in lockdown or there may be delays in getting the, the inside prisoners into that learning space. Um, uh, our interpretation of the overall impact of the programme for all students, inside and outside students, was the capacity for them to, to challenge stereotyping, to contribute to this notion of the othering, allowing them to see themselves as people with a shared interest. And as we've already mentioned, achieve through a democratic, participatory, dialogic, brave space. Thank you. What you share really uh, speaks volumes to the transformative power of these experiences and certainly to the fact that it's more than just a class and that it, these experiences also follow the participants beyond the end of, uh, of, of that class. Uh, my next question, the sixth question would be uh, for Sandy and Paul, uh, and it's what is the content of your courses? Is it specific? Is it flexible? In what ways? It is very flexible, <clears throat> sorry. 
Educators from all academic disciplines are eligible to come to the Warsaw Bridges five-day training. Uh, the training is required in order to teach uh, with, the, with the program. Uh, so that means that we have offered Warsaw Bridges classes in a diversity of academic subjects, including uh, English literature, sociology, gender studies, criminology, social work, philosophy, and even uh, geography. So it's, it's very diverse and flexible. And the, the programme aims to provide um, unique insights into the complexities of prison life through the lens of prison education. So in partnership with that, concepts like social justice, othering, longing, were all outlined and discussed theoretically, politically, I think importantly through lived experiences with the aim of developing how we understand stereotypes, how they've been embedded into all of our social structures and, and social norms. The programme drew on contemporary policy and academic positions to challenge such ideas, to explore some of the key tenets associated with prison life and prison education. So for example, uh, rehabilitation, resistance, transformative learning, and um, as Anne talked a moment ago, active citizenship. In addition, the programme, we're really clear about this, we wanted it to provide a space to evaluate the contribution and power of partnerships in reframing these social norms. And, and the power or, or sort of weighted expectation of education within that prison context to contribute to increased employability and reductions in recidivism upon release into uh, mainstream society were also explored again through those lived experience of participants and uh, those policy discourses and practices. Uh, and as such, participants critically examined uh, penal desistance, uh, rehabilitation theory and policy, there's a consideration that the contribution that education plays through prison education, policy and, and key education thinkers such as Ferrer with, with his philosophy of educational based on pedagogic dialogue and Illuris and the role of education as a mechanism for, for transforming identity, for how we think about ourselves and our, our relationship to others. So, so the role of partnership and social and active citizenship with a focus on the institutions of prisons and universities was very much critiqued throughout learning together. So just bouncing back on what Sandy, you said about a facilitated training. I'd like to ask Jen and uh, Anne to, to speak a bit more. Is there uh, a training prior to delivering uh, your courses? So in the Walls of Bridges, you already mentioned that there was, Sandy. Um, what was the training like? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as Sandy mentioned, we have, uh, in order to teach a Wall Street Bridges class, you have to apply. And then uh, if you're accepted, there's quite a few applications from what I understand. Um, and they accept uh, a certain number of, of university post-secondary instructors uh, for the training. And you do a five-day uh, intensive facilitator training course, which takes place inside the Grand Valley Institution for Women, which is a federal penitentiary here in Ontario, um, where Shoshana actually teaches. Um, and so holding the training inside a prison setting, a carceral institution, is a really important first step, I think, for familiarizing, um, you know, would-be facilitators with institutional security protocol, with the additional complications and responsibilities that come with teaching in these types of spaces. And so the training, it not only teaches future course facilitators how to mobilize circle pedagogy, how to structure their courses, how to incorporate Walls to Bridges principles and philosophy, um, similar to what Paul was talking about, the Freire and techniques in, in terms of um, democratic participation in education, um, how to incorporate all of that into dis class discussions, into class assignments, um, and how to teach and learn with your whole self, as Sandy mentioned earlier. Um, but also how to establish partnerships between your home institution, your university institution, and the local correctional facility where you'll be where you'll be offering the course. So the facilitator training is led by uh, well Shoshana, of course, but also incarcerated and non-incarcerated Walls to Bridges alumni. 
um, and Wall Street Bridges instructors. So it's a really experiential kind of training in that participants actively engage in all of the pedagogical processes that are the foundation of a Wall Street Bridges classroom. So we do all of the breakout um, sort of exercises. We do all the different types of uh, things that you would incorporate, tactics and strategies that you incorporate into your classroom. Um, and this means that participants are really asked to engage in the holistic learning exercises that involve the mind, the body, the spirit, emotions, uh, that focus on things like self-awareness, reflexivity, social justice, this non-hierarchical facilitation that we've been mentioning. All of these things are fundamental to Walls to Bridges pedagogy. So the facilitation training, uh, at least for me, was really eye-opening. It stands in stark contrast to the kind of isolation and the individual control that we typically experience when designing a post-secondary course. So instead of that one-way transmission of in information from the professor who's the expert to the student learner, Walls to Bridges training requires that facilitators also engage in self-reflection, that they be able to learn from the experiences that are shared by their students that they think more deeply about educational praxis and how to build a collaborative uh, learning community within a prison setting, which is you know, no small feat to be sure. Uh, and the training I think really encourages us to reflect as university professors on our own privilege and how it shapes traditional post-secondary teaching and learning um, sort of strategies and approaches for sure. I'll leave it there and pass it over to Anne. My response to this question is much shorter, Alexis. In, in, uh, in our programme, essentially the answer is no. There is no training programme. So um, if, if academic colleagues um, want to undertake a Learning Together programme, the onus is it's on them to speak to their um, prison partners and to negotiate how that might be established. That said, you know, the academic team for, for Paul, Kirsty, and I and others who've been involved in delivering our Learn Together programmes in partnership with our partners. You know, we, we are all experienced academics who have significant numbers of years of experience engaged in prisoner life and prisoner communities. So we did have some knowledge base, but essentially training to undertake the programme, no. It's quite interesting. Having, uh, like myself, having taken the facilitator training with uh, Shoshana and Tori, and also having the opportunity to uh, shadow uh, one of your seminars, Jen, uh, those experiences were certainly very powerful and, and again, transformative. I, I think that we, we, we got a lot of tools that um, I've been able to mobilize in, in courses that are also not walls to bridges and, and really take that outside of, of that specific program also. Um, so my eighth question would be for Tori and Paul. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your alumni and if you keep in touch uh, with the alumni? If, if so, how do you do that? And what role do past uh, students from the program uh, play uh, in, in uh, both Walls to Bridges and Learning Together? The Walls to Bridges alumni are absolutely essential to our program and stay in touch in a variety of ways. The National Hub in Ontario, Canada has two alumni collectives and other regional alumni groups have also emerged. The Grand Valley Institution Walls to Bridges Collective, also known as the GVI Collective, was created by students during the first Walls to Bridges class at the federal prison in Kitchener, Ontario in 2011. I was a member of this class. In Canada, at the end of each class, the students collaborate to conduct, to conduct a group project that serves as a final assignment and is typically presented to the audience who are invited to attend the final graduation ceremony. Following the completion of the first class in 2011, the graduating class decided to create an alumni group consisting of any students who had completed a class as a way for inside and outside students, along with instructors, to maintain contact with each other throughout the year. Due to the institutional barriers, the Canadian federal prison system does not allow anyone who has previously volunteered in the institution which includes students and professors, to maintain any type of contact. And since relationships are so central to Walls to Bridges courses, we felt it was essential for our group to find some way to maintain contact with one another. 
And in 19, I mean, in 2013, Ontario members of the alumni collective began being released from prison. Yet we wanted to stay a way to continue to for our connection and our work together. So a community collective um, growing in other parts. So a community collective uh, developed so that they could um, create workshops and other um, educational um, contributions. The key aspect we continue to share in common include our goals of promoting access to education for all criminalized people, eliminating stigma surrounding marginalized and criminalized groups, and advocating for a world based on social justice, uh, reconciliation, equity, and transformative change. And with the added restrictions of the pandemic, some of the Walls to Bridges collectives have continued in different ways to stay connected with members inside and outside of the prison. In fact, our most recent work is collaborating virtually with alumni and instructors across the country to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Walls to Bridges. So, so clearly our Canadian colleagues have extensive uh, alumni networks, which is, which is deeply impressive, actually. From our perspective, in terms of learning together, I guess our answer is sort of yes and no. We were, we were really keen that as, as much as we were certainly able to, all of our students, inside and out students, were treated equally. That was absolutely paramount. And in line with how we might interact with students at our university campus, in reality, this was problematic, particularly for the prisoner students, largely, I guess, to some extent, because of the lack of any meaningful IT infrastructure, but, but, but also because of those security parameters that are in place in prisons. Uh, for our students in prison, communication and post programmes are certainly challenging. We were able to hold ad hoc advisory groups for planning of future programmes to which some alumni were invited and attended. Uh, they were invited by the prison staff. And a couple of alumni were permitted to engage in subsequent programmes as facilitators, as mentors. But the reality that this was down, largely down to the, to the goodwill of prison staff, to be honest. The university students, their commitment to the program, both to apply and to be on the program during the program, on completion of the program, was 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 impressive. Many of the students have subsequently contributed to university open day events. They've contributed to lectures and seminars about the project. They're real advocates for it. A number tell us that because of the program and following graduation, it's actually shaped their employment uh, strategies uh, and, and going into areas they might not have considered prior to, to undertaking the programme. But certainly when we compare it to what our Canadian colleagues just talked about, our formal alum, we don't really have a formal alumni network in the same way that um, Tori's just outlined. Before I before I I, I, uh, I go forward with the, the next question, I'd like to invite also the audience members. If you have any questions, right, you can you can send them in, so so we'll be able to to ask your questions afterwards to the the, the panelists, and maybe bouncing back on on some of the items that you spoke about, Paul. Um, what are the logistic challenges that you face in setting up your programs or setting up your partnerships? Are there ongoing additional challenges that that appeared after those those um, those programs were, were set up um, and for anyone in the audience that might be interested in uh, with developing these kinds of initiatives right do you have any words of advice uh, that you could offer based on your experience uh, so for Canada it'll be Shoshana and for England Kirsty yes I mean over the last 10 years, we've encountered all sorts of um, opportunities and challenges. Uh, at this point, we have um, partnerships between 15 post-secondary uh, institutions and 15 correctional institutions across the country. So I would say one of the biggest things that we've learned and the biggest piece of advice I would give to educators is to connect with someone within the correctional facility that you're interested in working in who believes in your mandate 
and who can support the values and practices of the educational program. We typically call this person the champion of our program because they can act as a liaison between you and the facility and ensure that things run as smoothly as possible. As Paul mentioned, there are many logistics and challenges when two bureaucratic institutions with very different goals and logics partner together. In Walls to Bridges, we um, develop memorandums of understanding between the university or college and the prison and jail to set out the responsibilities of both parties. This is an important document that um, ensures people, both institutions, um, are clear about their responsibilities. For Walls to Bridges, um, classes funding comes from either the post-secondary institution or from private donors, or sometimes from foundation foundations. It really varies um, from university to university. But what is uh, what never varies and what is a significant way that we operate is that the university always pays the tuition for the inside students and awards course credits for students who successfully complete the class. Thanks, Shoshana. I'll be covering similar things for learning together. So in relation to some of the logistical challenges related to funding, um, so learning together as a network is often the recipient of various sort of financial rewards, charitable donations, but that funding tends to get funneled into things like research and development, which then can obviously benefit the network and support its future expansion. And obviously, um, it's really important that an evidence base is, is, is there for something like learning together. So we know what, what works, how it works and all of those sorts of things. But locally, in thinking about NTU, Nottingham Trent University, um, it's the university and the prison partner who have to fund the facilitation of the programme. So at our university, we've received the support of management locally who fund learning together through resourcing the programmes. Um, so they will fund staff time to develop and deliver materials and also finance the materials needed for all students on the programme. So both um, NTU students and students inside prisons as well. Prisons also um, contribute in terms of funding. So prisons similarly resource programmes to providing things like operational support and the learning space for programme delivery. So essentially costs are divided between the university and the relevant prison partner. But funding aside, there's also um, the issue of negotiation. So whilst all of our prison partners have been massively supportive in both the design and the delivery of Learning Together programmes, I think it's fair to say that our prison partners initially came to Learning Together with slightly different uh, perspectives um, in relation to what Learning Together can and should be. Um, in part, that often uh, reflected some notable variation in institutional cultures and priorities. And in the absence of a formalised memorandum of understanding, which I know Walsh Bridges have, there's a constant need to negotiate and renegotiate the content and delivery mechanisms of learning together. And that's something that's been a common thread throughout our partnerships throughout the many years we've been delivering learning together. So as a result of that, we've quickly learned to recognise that different institutional objectives and operational pressures mean that we often have to compromise um, in order to ensure programmes go ahead. Uh, fortunately, though, we've never felt that this has been at the expense of the ethos of our Learning Together programmes. For our 10th question, I feel that we've had a, a bit... <laughs> Jen, you're laughing a lot. I feel like we've been, we had a, a bit of answers to that question already throughout the presentation, but I'll, I'll still ask you to maybe synthesize more, even more information. What do you think have been the key impacts of your programs on the inside students that come from the correctional facilities, on the outside students that come uh, possibly from the university uh, network, but also maybe more broadly? For uh, Canada, it would be Shoshana and uh, England Paul. Thank you. A few years ago, we conducted a couple of evaluation reports um, on the impact of our program. One of these reports was the impact on students. And consistent with how we teach our classes and how we run our program, this research was informed by participatory action methods. 
So that means our interview guide was co-developed by inside students and outside students. And we also provided training and in interviewing skills and data analysis to our group of um, inside students at the prison. So they were both um, researchers and interviewers for this project. One of the central findings of the study was that research participants said, and these are, these are both inside and outside students, that our classes broke down stereotypes and preconceived notions about the other. For example, inside students had concerns about being judged and being considered not smart enough or dangerous by outside students. Inside students also said that they worried that they wouldn't have anything in common with the outside students. They also mentioned that through the community building activities that we teach in our training and we implement in our classrooms and the other dialogical teaching methods, inside students experienced a feeling of feelings of acceptance and connection and found that they too had some of their stereotypes dismantled. On the part of the outside students, the ones coming from the university, they said that they had initially been concerned that they would have been thought of as privileged or naive. Some discovered also, as was already mentioned by some of our alumni now, um, that they had some biases about who their prison co-learners would be. And this discovery helped push them towards further self-reflection on the ways in which stereotypes and lack of connection foster harmful biases and preconceptions. Shortly after that, we conducted an evaluation study on the impact of our classes on the correctional facilities that host them. And the findings from that study found that the prison personnel appreciated the connection to the university community and the bridges being built through our partnerships. This research also found that preconceptions and stereotypes about prisoners were challenged. And those preconceptions and stereotypes were held by folks who were working in the prison. Some facilities reported an increase in what they call the culture of education within their facility. And an important finding for the Canadian context was, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, it's absolutely crucial that the, each facility, each correctional facility have a champion um, who will help advocate for the program and act as a li liaison. Um, if anyone's interested in seeing the results from those studies, um, we've got the reports put up on our website, which I believe has been put in the chat. Thanks, Shoshana. Um, we, we've also conducted our own research um, on learning together. And what's very interesting there is that there, there's certainly some overlaps in our findings, but some differences as well, not least, I would say, in terms of the institutional impact. And that's perhaps something we can explore in the Q&A potentially. But anyway, our research demonstrates the, the influence of the programme has been extensive. Personally, for students and the academic team, it's hugely rewarding and challenging, of course. Uh, navigating institutional systems, negotiating inst institutional barriers from both institutions necessitates a lot of time, energy, resilience, tenacity. But the rewards, uh, I'd say, have been substantial, um, demonstrating growth in, in knowledge of, of topics, confidence, maybe to engage in dialogue, understanding of, of oneself and, and of others in that learning space and elsewhere, and skills, of course. Those skills might be development of, of academic posters, academic writing, delivering speech, presentations to a large audience, and to name, to name but a few. Professionally, uh, facilitating learning together has provided opportunities to collaborate with academic colleagues, as well as prison-based colleagues, particularly prison education colleagues, allowing for the development of knowledge, skills, and understanding and, and co-producing that of, of both higher education and prison education structures and systems. For students, I'd argue this is where the most impact is revealed. Our research and evaluation activities with all students uh, demonstrate the courses result in significant and in some instances I'd say quite profound changes in attitudes and understanding of the significance of difference and yet, sorry, the insignificance of difference, and yet the enormity of difference between university-based learners and prison learners. Um, for partners, 
There was some noteworthy and healthy support from partners for the provision of the programme. But institutional barriers limited some of those opportunities for the, the development of deep, long lasting engagement. And, and perhaps that's where some of the differences are in what Shoshana was just talking about. I'd argue this is where the focus of work, certainly for us now, needs to be to embed those prison university partnerships, recognizing their transformational potential, particularly in relation to, to social and economic outcomes. Paul, you mentioned skills. It's one of those skills, time management, because we're doing great on time. We have two questions left before we open questions to the public. Um, so the, 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 the elevent question would be about what you find, and maybe that's in contrast to the challenges we face, but what you find to have been successful about the programs uh, you're, you're uh, uh, Walls to Bridges and Learning Together. Could you give us a few examples about how you've experienced or identified such successes, uh, Jen and Kirsten? So I'll, I'll be brief, but um, I think Shoshana started to mention a few of these things. And, and one measure of program success is you know, when the instructor steps out of the expert role and moves into a collaborator or facilitator role in the learning process. Um, and as, as Sandy said earlier, teaching these courses, it was it was like turning her into a student again. And so it's it's a very interesting way for professors, I think, to um, shift their thinking around pedagogy. Um, and there are lots of different markers of success. Just if we think about the the raw numbers, um, so far we've had almost 1,200 students uh, who have experienced a Walls to Bridges class. I think the number is 11. 1,190 students in total uh, in Canada that have taken these courses. Um, we have, as Shoshana mentioned earlier, we have Walser Bridges programs cropping up in a number of different provinces now. We've got 15 universities, post-secondary institutions, and 15 prisons um, that have partnerships now. Uh, so that's that's quite um, that's that's quite a feat given the size of the country, of course. Um, we've got all of these different alumni, local alumni collectives and groups that are starting to, to keep in touch, which is something that, that takes a lot of groundwork uh, to do and to maintain. Um, and we've had a few incarcerated students continue on to, to do post-secondary uh, education, coming out of once they're released back into the community, applying and going to university and, and to college. And um, that might be the, the most important uh, measure of success overall is that it's opening the doors to post-secondary education to uh, folks that might not have otherwise thought that they, you know, could have that type of experience um, and, and really opening the doors for them. So those are some of the, the general markers of success that we can certainly talk about. Kirsty? Cheers, Jen. So um, as you might expect, something like success is highly subjective and understandings of such can vary not just from programme to programme, but year to year, cohort to cohort, and individual to individual. Um, as I spoke about earlier, running learning together is often met with challenges, whether that is logistical challenges that I went through earlier in terms of funding and negotiation, but also political challenges. So often the lead up and week to week, um, facilitating learning together can be quite stressful. So by the time I get to the end of it, if a programme has run with little disruption, or interference from, you know, the university or from our prison partner. And students have, on the whole, enjoyed it and, you know, have been academically, personally or professionally challenged. Then we would say that that program has been a success. But more than that, um, we'd also judge success based on the strength of the relationship that we have with that particular prison partner. So, for example, if they want to facilitate further learning together programs with us or if they are you know interested in perhaps working with us again in the future in other ways that would also be an indicator of success so just kind of sticking with that for a moment um not just kind of um maintaining that link and developing the relationship with that particular prison partner but also developing new partnerships on the back of uh, what we've facilitated elsewhere and obviously with that, sometimes if there's an opportunity to draw funding, um, then that again would be an indicator of success. For, so quite recently, Anne and the project team have been awarded some money to develop a distance learning, uh, learning together programme, a prison partner here in England. 
And again, that's probably on the back of some of the success that we've experienced as a result of our Learning Together programmes. But I think if we put all of that to one side and think about actually the students who've actually been part of Learning Together and been uh, a member of a programme, um, we've had lots of feedback throughout the years that actually um, being a learner on a Learning Together programme has led to them having perhaps a new lease of confidence, whether that is to engage with new people or education on the whole. That for us is, you know, in the case of success. Um, and if, if I think more so perhaps about our university students, some of them have thought about perhaps going into a new career on the back of going into um, our, a local prison, for example. So just to kind of summarise, um, facilitating a Learn Together programme, as others have already mentioned, on the whole does allow for transformative experiences and they differ from person to person. Um, and that, just the essence of that for us as a staff team is the defining feature of success. If people feel like they've got undergone a transformative experience by being part of a Learning Together programme. So we're already at the last question of the, the presentation itself before we move to the questions from the, the public. Uh, so the last question, but certainly not the least, um, in what way does your program address inequities such as those related to poverty, racialization, and other barriers to education? Um, Shashana on, uh, from Canada, for Canada and uh, Anne from England. I'll just be brief in terms of adding to what has already been shared, but um, Wall Street Bridges has equity and power sharing at the core of all its values and practices. The compounding factors of colonialism, racism, poverty, gender violence have resulted in a dramatic overrepresentation of Indigenous and Black people in Canadian prisons. So providing access to education within a co-learning model that infuses multiple perspectives and lived experiences is one way of creating opportunities and a strategy for addressing and exploring how systemic oppression is related to criminalization. And thanks, Shoshana. Um, I think we've we've um, discussed most of the aspects of our, our programs, and I think it's pretty evident that in England we are definitely uh, just moving out of the infancy stage, but we haven't got to the teenage stage that the Walls to Bridges program has has achieved as yet. So. In our programs, we didn't set out to address any particular inequalities. We built our programs on the basis of equality. So we wanted to treat our, our all of our students with equity. But the concepts of um, inequality were explored and, and arguably not through the academic facilitation, but through the dialogue that happened in the learning spaces where you know, um, our students and, and our, our whole learning body critiqued and challenged what was being said, how it was being said, you know, through a, a critical examination of the criminal justice system or social justice principles, these things that people have lived through unquestioningly, we provided the opportunity or a, an opportunity was provided for those conversations to happen. And, and one of the really interesting things about um, equality and equity and how that was felt um, demonstrates how powerful community groups can be, particularly when those spaces are being determined by institutional challenges. So, for example, in, in some of our programmes, it was absolutely determined by the institutions that the space was inhabited by a member of the prisoner staff, which um, arguably challenge the, the, the learning space. So we had lots of lived experiences that allowed students to have significant and deep reflections on their lived experience, quite um, powerful emotional experiences really, uh, and some quite frustrated reflections on the part of our um, university students. But by drawing on this framework, this critical pedagogic approach that Frere offers, we were able to examine societal structures in quite a systematic way uh, and we raised um, or, uh, or a critical consciousness was raised of both the barriers that had been created towards education and the capacity for education to expose inequalities. So the role of the individual to develop a, a real a reaction to such oppression 
was experienced by some as, as quite empowering, actually. Thanks, Alexis. 22 minutes to spare for questions. Excellent. So if you have any questions and you still want to, to forward it, please send them so we can ask uh, say questions to, to the panelists. Um, so the first question I've received that I'll, I'll, I'll communicate is more a technical element. And the person would like to know, um, how did you first, so, and you spoke a bit about this uh, in the presentation, but how did you establish your first contact with the carceral facilities, the institutions? Um, and what was kind of like your approach to that um, if you were giving advice to someone who has no, no idea kind of how to start that? I mean, I could offer some commentary. I'm sure others will have them. But I think this is about, um, it's a, a personal interest, isn't it? So, you know, my, my uh, interest in prison education extends to a couple of decades now. So I was a real advocate for uh, enabling education students to access education in prisons. Um, so by providing placement opportunities, student volunteering opportunities, enabling students to go into the prison space. So I, I built relationships over periods of years that were established in the education settings in prisons. It, it, and my ambition was to deconstruct this idea that this place was um, it wasn't seen. So I was trying to expose this as a, a, a learning space that existed in the adult learning world. So for me, it was it was already rooted in a, a research base. So you have to get on the phone and just talk to people. Can I just add to what Anne said, please, and say I agree with everything that Anne said. And I guess from my perspective, my involvement was driven by all of those things that Anne talked about. I'm going to be brutally honest here as well, Alexi, and just say that to an extent, it, it, it was fortuitous and a little bit of luck involved as well, in the sense that one of our undergraduate students had um, spent some time incarcerated. He was a fantastic student. We got talking about different things and it transpired that he was affiliated to the University of Cambridge in, in the UK. We ended up at an event and it sort of spiraled from there and got introduced to different partners. But I think it's obviously not just about luck, but that can play a role. Uh, and I, I would just say that passion needs to be there. There are increasingly networks um, for prisoner university partnerships in all kinds of jurisdictions. So sort of from a technical level, it's worth just exploring what partnerships exist where you're located, because the chances are there will be a network that you can tap into. And... And I think it's just about exploring that and just really pushing that through and pushing that passion through, through, through the combination of those factors. <clears throat> Excuse me. On um, this side of uh, Walls to Bridges, is there someone that would... Uh... Yeah, what we've noticed kind of across our programming is that um, it's really important to find the one person inside. Usually there's only one who's really like all about this program. And what we've found is that they're usually in the educational section of a prison if they've got one or a social development section it's sometimes called but someone who's kind of involved in some programming um, and uh, what we have found is usually not always but usually that person uh, understands the kind of value of our program and and has a passion for it and they'll help make all they'll help it develop those relationships not all prisons or jails in Canada have um accepted our invitation to provide um, our classes, but um, most have. Anne, you mentioned getting on the phone. Someone wants to know what the phone number is. No, I'm kidding. Um, so based on what you said, so finding someone that's that's kind of really receptive to these ideas that that would like to, uh, to, to, to kind of open the door to these kinds of, of partnerships and contributions. Um, could, you, could you tell us a bit more about um, because sometimes public opinion is is really not necessarily favorable to to these ideas, right? They're not seeing those spaces as valid spaces for higher education, education, and such, right? So, whether in your own national context or even like internationally, how do you kind of open those dialogues? Um, 
do you have any any advice on that to kind of like um, maybe um, help individuals see the potential um, in these kinds of programs where there, it's not necessarily receptive from the get go? Right? Jen? I can take a stab if people, yeah, if people are all quiet. Um, it, you know, I think as academics, I think the first thing that we would think about, um, and I think a lot of us have done this already, is to publish material that talks about uh, the benefits, that describes uh, the impact that these types of programs have on, on the facilitators, on uh, the inside students, on the outside students. Shoshana mentioned that Walter Bridges has done some, some really interesting technical reports that she's got posted on the, the Walter Bridges website. Um, other sort of peer-reviewed material. So, uh, you know, a bunch of us have published a few different things. That, at the very least, helps to have and generate a discussion amongst academics. And I think that that conversation is growing. Um, and then I think at the local context, something that we can do, it, it, this idea of getting it out more into the public, I, a lot of it has to do with what Shoshan was mentioning about building the connection with the institution that, that you're working at and having a, a, a sort of a respectful dialogue and building a connection and building a relationship so that <clears throat> the, the folks that are working in the institution come to rely on you and to, and to a certain extent, you know, value you coming in and offering these courses. They see the benefit themselves and sort of working in that way because, you know, the more you're present in, in the prison environment and people see that what you're doing is having a positive impact on uh, the individuals that take the classes and the way that that can ripple out into the rest of the prison uh, environment, right, amongst other prisoners that see what some of these students are doing and how interesting that is, it can have a positive calming effect uh, inside the prison. So there, there, there's support coming from within. And then, of course, doing things like this where it's public conferences, uh, applying for grant money where we can you know, do research on these initiatives, make these things public, hire former students inside and outside students to participate and sort of building these other types of connections. I think that's kind of where we are now. I think most of us, I can't speak for everyone, of course, but I think most of us would be supportive of, of you know, pushing the public debate around this. Um, I think a lot of people get nervous around spending public money and how we do that and if it's going to prisoners and in what context. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that, uh, at least for Walls of Bridges, that the, owners, the onus for the financial costs is, is on the university. So the universities are making this investment to offer these courses to cover the registration fees for these students um, as a way to invest back into the community. And so that's the interesting bridge I think that is happening is that we are, we are investing in the community. We're investing in a community that, that largely doesn't get invested in um, and, and trying to provide those types of opportunities and, and other types of educational opportunities seem to crop up. So pandemic has happened. We're not allowed to go inside right now. Wall Street Bridges is kind of on hold. I'm assuming learning together is as well. Um, so, you know, we're trying to do another pilot initiative right now where it's not a traditional Wall Street Bridges class, but using all of the technology that we have in the classroom to pre-record lectures and have some students from an institution be registered. So uh, not with the right, the, not the right, not with the same pedagogical approach, but at least maintaining that connection and trying to reach as many incarcerated students as possible. Just, just yeah, I, th I think they're, they're, they're brilliant reflections. And I think, I mean, I think undoubtedly piercing that, that cloak of invisibility and perhaps challenging those penal populist discourses it isn't an easy thing to do. I'm always massively interested in ripple effects, and I was very interested in what our Canadian colleagues were talking about in terms of the impact it might have had on the institutions they're working in, because the people that work in those institutions have families, and actually that ripple effect is shouldn't be underestimated because... Before you know it, there's a sort of critical mass of people that have been exposed to these programs and are maybe starting to think differently. And equally, the outside students have families and their families come to our celebration events and they challenge their stereotypes. And that's sort of then that process of de-othering and trying to pierce that cloak of invisibility can start to take place alongside UNESCO webinars alongside trying to have the voice of policy make you know have the ear of policymakers and and just shaping the discourse in different ways and in subtle ways can, can be really or well, it's rewarding and you can start to see that ripple effect really start to, to manifest itself 
but it's 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 not so easy because these are you know by their very nature they're invisible institutions who often don't want or or are not very good at letting people know what goes on behind those walls and so what we can do to pierce that and then change the discourse i think we sort of feel this doesn't sound too glib some sort of duty to do that and be involved with this otherwise what's the point uh, so there's a typhoon of questions. I'm going to try to organize them as best as possible. And bouncing back on some of the things that you that you already talked about, I'm going to ask you two questions at the same time. One, how are you able or, or finding ways of taking the knowledge that's produced inside of the classroom, right, um, and bringing it outside also? So I think Jen, you had mentioned articles for example, scientific articles and so forth. Um, so that one, do you have any other strategies in regards to that? And maybe echoing what Paul was saying, um, how are, are you engaged in any kind of lobbying or pu pushing for a public debate about the relevance of these kinds of programs in uh, carceral institutions uh, and prisons? Um, and do, do you have any examples? And I'm feeling maybe some people also from the audience might have ideas about that to, to share along the line, but yeah, do you have examples of that? I think I can start Alexia in talking about um, Walls to Bridges uh, and Canada. So in terms of how do we get the information out of the classroom into the public, um, along with some of the academic scholarship that Jen and Sandy and I have produced, um, what has been, incredible to me over the years is the number of inside and outside students who have chosen to publish in peer-reviewed journals their uh, analysis and experience of Walls to Bridges classes. So, not, so that's one way. Um, it's sort of noteworthy because it means students were motivated enough to want to go, go through a process of writing an academic article, which as we all know is, is a lot of work. Um, so that's sort of striking and it's out there publicly and it's on our website um, as well. Um, the other piece that is really unique to us and important for us is that the it's the voices of our students that tend to get um, a lot of public airing and has influence. So both inside the prison and outside. So our alumni groups do a lot of public education um, on the outside when they're released, which means that they're invited to community organizations, other university classrooms, sometimes to parole and probation officers to talk about their experience of our program and our teaching methods. So that's kind of one way it, it kind of helps engage that conversation. The other thing is the students inside, even after one course, they start to tell everyone that they know in the prison, this is a really important course. Can we get more? Here's what I learned. Here's my materials. Here's what happened for me. And in fact, just recently, I got a call from a prison uh, warden and another professor from somewhere who said there's like a group of guys in this one prison who are just like at them to offer this class. They had taken one class at another place, at another prison, and um, they were really, really insistent that they find ways to bring this kind of education to them. So I don't want to underestimate, it's, it might feel counterintuitive, but I don't want to underestimate the power of students, both incarcerated and incars un not incarcerated, um, to be the voice of, of bringing this forward and entering this uh, kind of public discussion. I also want to add that um, Paul said the ripple effect, and I think I want to re reiterate that the instructor training that was established at the federal prison in Kitchener, the inside and outside alumni are facilitators and facilit fac facilitating an intensive training from different educators, professors across Canada and elsewhere. Canada is such a huge country. And so to be able to mobilize and collaborate together from province to province is really important. Um, so again, I'll combine to, oh, yes, uh, Paul, sorry. It was, just, it was just a very small point. I think um, clearly, you know, academic journals and the academic community has a role to play in this. But in a way, <clears throat> I suppose the, the I don't want to, overestimate but equal I don't want to underestimate the role that the media play in this I mean one of the reasons we invite media outlets to our celebration events is 
because we know how valuable learning together is and we want them to see that. So I think working with local or even national media or even international media on this and working internationally as we're doing today, you know, Canadian and UK colleagues coming together and sharing that message through the media outlets because the potential then to get to a bigger audience and to share these these stories is 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 important so clearly the academic community is important this is but equally you know it's about that sort of apex of that on the triangle of policy makers the general public in inverted commas and the media and all forms of media you know traditional and social media and working within that those, those different apexes i think is important as well Again, I'll combine two questions together. So uh, someone wanted to know what are the, what's the, well, in the context of, of COVID also, so Jen had mentioned that it, it might be more difficult to kind of get into classrooms and, and such, right? But even more generally, what is the proportion of the institutions that you've approached that have said a hard no and that you haven't been able, or maybe not a proportion, but maybe just a number uh, compared to those that you that you have uh, approached that said, no, we're not interested or, or, or it's not going to be possible. And is something like Zoom um, or distance learning a strategy that you feel could work with your programs to kind of give access or is that something that wouldn't necessarily fit well with the way that your programs are designed so if i, if I just start in in england during covid um access to prisons was was not possible and in fact access for the prisoners to any sort of education was markedly reduced so whilst most of our education provision could turn itself with some challenges into a technological offer that wasn't the case in, in prisons in England. And um, for the most part, the best outcome was the opportunity, if it was available for an advocate or a valued member of staff to be able to give worksheets through a cell door. And certainly the Learning Together Network played a part in providing some thinklets for um, our prisoner learners, but it was sporadic, ad hoc, uh, and pretty challenging. Um, even for those um, approximately 2,000 HE learners in our prison estate at the moment, getting access to their OU resources, their, their paper-based resources, was really challenging. Um, going forward, we've just started to see the estate, um, you know, we had a double tragedy because we had Fishmongers Hall as well as COVID that, that um, forced a re-evaluation and a review and a rethink of, of learning together um, but our, our prison estate are just starting to open up and just starting to we're just starting those tentative conversations about how can we um, provide some opportunities for these bodies of students to continue to be exposed to each other and learn together uh, and we're lucky because some of our prison partners are real believers and supporters of the programme, as is our HE institution. Uh, and as, as colleagues have said, you know, um, whilst we're talking about the value, the ripple effects, equally, the, the, the similar tension is the fragility of those relationships. We have this, you know, you have an advocate, you have a person, if they move on, theoretically, you know, arguably that whole relationship can just dismantle very, very quickly. So we are, we are looking at how we can more readily provide digital learning opportunities, but certainly in the prisons in England, the infrastructure is fractured. So um, it's it's limited. The opportunity to provide um, a lecture space isn't there. The, the, the technological capability isn't there. So we are just starting to explore the extent to which we can feasibly offer a higher education digital learning offer. But, you know, ultimately, the opportunity for real talk, this conversation, this brave space is what made the Learn Together, the Prison University Partnership Learning so powerful. And I'll just quickly answer from the Canadian perspective. I don't keep the numbers on which jails or prisons are not interested um, when we approach them. But of the few that come to mind, um, it's they're generally 
in Canada, we've got a federal system and a provincial system. The federal system is for folks doing much longer sentences, two years or more. The federal system is very supportive of, of us and has actually asked me how we can get into every federal prison nationally. The provincial systems tend to be less receptive. They are smaller, they have much shorter time, people are often on remand. So in some of those cases, um, the those smaller jails, we call them here, are more feeling more nervous about bringing outside students in and are more concerned about security and, and also kind of what we would be teaching is sometimes a concern. So on those occasions, um, we, we agree it's not a mutually, it's not a good partnership for any of us. In terms of internet and Zoom learning, we went through a long, long discussion, Tori will remember this, with our team inside, this, by team I mean the incarcerated women that form my steering committee, um, about whether we could do walls to bridges by Zoom. We really gave it a really good thinking through and discussion and we eventually concluded mostly due to the fact that the prison we're working in doesn't have adequate technology for us, um, would only have kind of one uh, computer and one screen for the whole class. Um, anyway, a whole bunch of, uh, we, were, we, we really talked it through and we concluded it won't work for us based on the uh, relational learning and the experiential learning um, principles behind our program. Thank you. Apologies for the questions we weren't able to ask, but I, I see Geneviève is going to, to close this. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. It was uh, perfect, very inspiring. Uh, we learned a lot, and I'm I'm, I hope uh, some other initiatives like this will uh, be uh, done uh, elsewhere. That's uh, very uh, access to get graduate studies, to, to university classes is very important also, So, uh, and very important for the, for, the, for, for the chair. Thank you very much. Maybe with the questions left, uh, we will see how it's, we could answer them in maybe our newsletter or other uh, other ways, but uh, thank you again. Uh, I would like also to invite you to our next event that will be uh, held on December 1st at 10 o'clock uh, Montreal uh, time. And it will be on the Senegal challenges of the prison system, a portrait of the current situation in Senegal, the challenges of prison education and ex ex existing initiatives. Uh, so it's uh, this was our first uh, of a series of five event. Hope to see you uh, next uh, webinar. And uh, thanks you again for all our panelists. It was very, very uh, appreciate. Thank you.